Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the University of Wyoming Laramie County Extension Office's version of the Wyoming Bee College Conference, the virtual side of it. And tonight's speaker is Sebastian Owen, and he is going to talk to us about bee nutrition and some other little details with bees. So let me, I still have quite a few people, I still have people in the queue joining us, but I'm gonna read you his information he sent me. So he is with Vita B Health, and Vita B Health is a mite control and honeybee health specialist. It's the world's largest dedicated supplier of honeybee health products to the honey and pollination industry with a rigorous and ethical approach to research and development into honeybee health. Their headquarters are in the UK, which is where Sebastian is at. So he's up at some horrible hour in the morning to do this for us. So I just so appreciate him being here. But their headquarters are in the UK. They have offices in Italy and the USA and Russia. They have partners across the globe. And Vita B Health does research and develop manufactures a range of honeybee health products. They promote sustainable beekeeping through integrated pest management, which is need to be a master gardener. No, I'm kidding. Um, integrated pest management is all you always start with your, your least toxic control methods for bad bugs and then you work your way up the ladder. Treatments are designed to inhibit the buildup of resistance whenever possible contain natural compounds and biological controls that are benign to all but the target pest, which is very cool. This is what I teach in the master gardener program at Laramie County. Sebastian Owen is the commercial director at Vita B Health. He's responsible for global sales, marketing, business development. He's got a background in biological science as a part-time beekeeper, helps out at the Vita B apiary when his traveling schedules allow, of course, and after spending some time living and working in Hong Kong, he has now been with Vita B for some 13 years, developing from his initial responsibility for the Central European region to his current role. So with that introduction of Sebastian, Sebastian, go ahead and unmute yourself. And you've got the program. Thank you very much, Catherine. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for, for joining tonight. Um, I've, I've looked at the you've seen already and, and have to come, and, and you've got some great speakers. Um, I, I feel a bit like the, the commercial interval here. Um, uh, I hope that, that we'll, we'll have some interesting topics. Um, I, I'm sorry, obviously, that we can't be there together in person. Um, it's 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 fine doing these things by Zoom. What, what I really miss um, is the the sort of interaction and seeing whether you're you're following and understanding or or, or whether there's any that aren't quite clear. So please get in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on it as I'm talking. If you have any questions along, then um, then please put them in the chat box and I'll I'll get to them when I can. Um, failing that, we'll, uh, I'll hand at the end and and any questions we can address as well. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm just going to assume that you can hear me okay and that you can see the screen. And uh, I'll assume that somebody will shout out if um, if you can't. So a quick overview. Um, those that, that don't know the company, um, you may have heard of, of two of our products, Apigard and, and for Varroa Control. So we're, we're primarily a, a Varroa Control company. We've been going now for um, getting on for third years. Um, proud in in an industry that you know, as a big you may not know when you're you're buying your treatment for health whether your dollar is actually going into the pocket of a company that makes pesticides or agrochemicals that may not be be quite as, as good for honeybee health as, as we'd like um, we're, we're very proud to be run company um, we're a very small company there's just six of us based in the uk um, uh, working around the world, active in about um, 55 or 60 countries, um, always working to keep your bees as, as healthy and productive as possible. 
But I don't want to talk about Varroa um, tonight. So obviously it is um, probably the, the biggest um, problem for, for honeybee health worldwide. But I, I think there's something that, um, that's not more important, but, but perhaps less talked about and something that's really worth um, addressing tonight, um, which is it's honeybee nutrition um, in particular, how a lot of beekeepers are doing it wrong and, and what we can all do uh, better to, to improve overall colony health and productivity. Some of what I'm going to talk about tonight um, is the result of work that we've done in RA um, in, in Basingstoke in the UK. So I thought you might be interested just to, to see a bit about where we are and, and what we do here. Uh, so we're based um, about 60 miles southwest of London in, in a small town called Basingstoke um, and about well less than a mile away from our apiary, from our office rather, as we have our, our apiary. Uh, it's a small apiary, um, certainly by, by US standards. So we've got about 10 of, um, colonies in the apiary, mostly running on, um, on Langstroth. Also got some British national colonies as well. Um, it's the, the apiary is in an allotment site, uh, which is a, a place where um, people that don't have uh, big enough gardens to grow crops, vegetables, uh, fruit, can, can rent at and, and, and do that there. So there's fantastic forage throughout the year uh, from the allotment gardens, but then also from the gardens of the lawn. And then the surrounding area is, um, is full of um, agricultural fields. So we have a lot of canola uh, um, and, uh, and great forage throughout the year for the bees. So this is, um, this is in the early days when we were getting in the apiary. So, we set up the apiary for uh, for a few reasons. Um, one is that we're a, a company of beekeepers, and uh, we want where to to go and um, and be able to spend time with the bees. Um, you know, not all of us are able to keep them at home. Um, the other reason is that um, my, with my colleagues Max and Paolo, who run the sort of technical side of things, the development, um, they're they're forever going to to Greece and Cyprus and Italy um, to to formal research trials uh, and they tell me it's, it's because the climate there is much better for beekeeping there's a longer period with brood and and uh, varroa develops better in in those regions pretty sure it's actually the coffee and the wine are better there but uh, they maintain it's it's better in trials but what we wanted to do with the apiary was was to allow ourselves to to run studies uh, not formal trials but studies um sort of quick and dirty to what's going on, the difference products make, how we can use them perhaps differently. And in particular, um, we, we looked at nutrition in the apiary. Um, and nutrition is, is um, increasingly important. You know, with every new scientific paper that's published, there's, there's more uh, reports about the importance of good nutrition. Uh, it's much more important than, than perhaps has been pre appreciated. I don't want to, to dwell on these three letters. We all know about colony collapse disorder. Um, we know there's not a, a sort of smoking gun cause that's been found for CCD. Uh, it's, it's almost certainly multifactorial um, with the combination of, of things like the use of agricultural pesticide, intensive agriculture and, and varroa and, and, and other things all combining to stress the bees and cause the colony to collapse. But evidence from, uh, from Greece, uh, from Italy and from Brazil uh, and, and others uh, is pointing the finger firmly towards nutrition as a leading fat colony collapse disorder. So researchers, for example, that bee bread is contaminated with a cocktail of chemicals. Um, I don't know if you can, can read this slide. It's not too, what, what, what you can see there is a, um, a pollen um, which is showing a huge number of chemicals a lot of them harmful to bees uh, that have been found in, in the pollen that the bees are collecting and, and bringing back to the hive. Um, and you see that that then builds up in the, in the bee bread and in the, in the food of the bees and results in a decrease in, in bee lifespan. So why is nutrition so important? Um, basic level, each, each colony in general has just one queen and she can lay about 2,000 eggs a day. Once uh, an egg's been laid in a cell, that's then occupied for around three weeks before a new egg can be laid inside. So there's a limit to the amount of brood you can produce. 
and a limit to the number of nurse bees that are required to look after that brood. So we know that for a good honey harvest, you need a strong nectar flow. Um, and it's also well known that large colonies are, are the most productive. And, and this is because as the colony becomes larger, the ratio of honeybees compared with brood is much, um, is much higher. Sorry, the, the ratio of, of adult bees compared with brood is, is much higher. So as we can see this on the left-hand side that there's, um, as the colony gets bigger, there are more foragers compared to the amount of, of brood and nurse bees. Those foragers obviously go out and make burst into honey. So to see on the right is that um, if you take a, a certain number of, of bees, they're almost always going to be more productive in one colony than if you split that same number of bees across multiple colonies. It's an exponential relationship between the number of bees and the, the maximum possible production of, of honey that, that that number of bees can reach. Not, not to say that you'll always get that amount of honey, but that's the, the capacity they have to reach. So how do they get to where nutrition comes in? To grow into a, a strong and productive colony, all the nutritional needs of the bee must be met. So bees, just like us, need carbohydrates, proteins, water, minerals, vitamins, lipids, which are fats, and, um, and lots of trace elements like magnesium. The carbohydrates that bees need, they get from nectar. About 60% of the carbohydrates come from nectar, and then the other 40% roughly comes from pollen. And they use these carbohydrates to use two types of fat. They produce, and then also body fat or vitelligenin. Bees can't store sugar directly. So this vitelligenin is deposited in the adipose tissue, especially in the autumn. And bees need protein to make enzymes to catch that reaction, the conversion into vitelligenin. Looking at the, the lifestyle of bees, larvae need hydrates. But in particular, what, what they really need is a lot of protein, which they get in the form of royal jelly, to support that development from egg to adult bee. After emerging, for the first two weeks of a bee's life, they're, they're in the hive, they produce uh, performing in hops like keeping the comb clean, feeding the larvae, building new comb. Uh, at that time, these newly emerged bees can really hard to build up their fat bodies as much as possible with protein, fatty acids and carbohydrate. So these early bees are using a lot of protein to produce royal jelly and wax. And this is where um, I think it's really important to, to look at the, the biology of what's going on. At that 14 day um, period, the, um, the bees, um, outside bees, witches or guard bees or whatever, um, at that time, after two weeks of building up their fatty body as much as possible, the peritrophic membrane surrounding the gut, the, the cells lining the gut, start to degrade, uh, which means that the bees can no longer absorb protein and, and they, from then on, their fat bodies are their only proteins. So that first two week period, in quantity of the fat body that they're able to produce in that time in that first two weeks go take the the length and the quality of the bee's life so what you can see on the on the left is a um, is a nice peritrophic membrane in the middle is a is a honeybee gut that's a bee that's been feeding on um, pollen and what you can see there is within the within the gut there are the pollen grains and there's a lot of space um, a lot of space which is taken up with water, uh, which is required to process those pollen grains. The hand side is the bee that's been fed with um, free amino acids. I'm going to explain a bit more about free amino acids later, but uh, what's important to note here is that the gut of that bee is absolutely packed with energy protein, um, with amino acids. There's, there's very little space there, which, which is because the free amino acids are so much easier to uh, process than, um, than pollen itself. And they don't need to be drollicized. So bees need two types of energy. Uh, they need energy for flight, which they get, um, and they need energy for metabolism um, from their body stores. 
So if there is only sugar in the bee's diet, they can fly, but they can't produce wax or royal jelly or, or all the other need. To convert um, nectar into, into what they can use, bees need to metabolize it. So metabolism is the chemical process of changing one thing to inside the body. Um, bees can't use sucrose, which is, is nectar, uh, or rather nectar is sucrose and, and the bees can't use it. So they need to metabolize it into glucose and fructose, which are sugars that they can use and, and store. To, to make this conversion, to have glands that, that convert protein into enzymes and the enzymes then, then affect the conversion. So obviously they need protein, they need protein to create those enzymes. Um, now you might be one step ahead of me here because um, I've mentioned that the crows that bees collect in the form of nectar, they can't use it directly, they need to convert it into glucose and fructose. So how about we help them by feeding them with fructose um, within that shortcut the process? Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. Um, if the bees receive sucrose, uh, glucose and fructose in their diet, they still need to metabolize it. So there's no advantage. They still need that protein. So the, the bees to, um, to make energy, they need protein as well as raw, raw carbohydrate. Um, and I think this are fueling your car. Cars essentially are crude oil, but if you try pumping that into the fuel tank, you wouldn't get very far. Um, it needs to be processed into gasoline first. And that's what the bees are doing. The, the key goal of any nutritional program is to feed pro protein, which allows them to produce the necessary enzymes to break glucose and generate energy. I think that's one of the sort of key points I'd like to make tonight. Nutritional programs should be designed to give protein to the bees to allow them to produce the necessary enzymes to break down glucose and, and generate energy. It comes naturally from pollen and bees need it for the growth of muscles and tissues, for enzymes, hormones, producing new cells, support their immune system. And to make these processes neutralize, which means break down proteins into their component amino acids. Um, and these amino acids are building blocks like the Legos of, of proteins, and they can be reformed into, into the proteins and enzymes that the bees need. If a particular amino acid is, is missing from a bee's diet, the body can synthesize it from other amino acids that are present in excess. But there are some amino acids that bees can't see. These are called essentially amino acids. What that means, they must be consumed in the diet. They're essential to be, to be consumed. And it, it's not just that they're required. They're all in that they, they must be in the diet, but they also must be there in the correct ratio. So you might hear, for example, that isine needs to comprise about 4% of the total protein content of the bee's diet. So when they're collecting pollen, they need that, that pollen to, to comprise 4% isolate. Now, if it doesn't, um, what bees can do is, is go and, and forage on a range of different pollen sources and, and the bee bread to, to create a protein source with approximately the right balance. But it may be the case, uh, and particularly with, with monoculture and uh, lack of forage, that that's not possible. If the, um, if the final protein still available to the bees only has, for example, 2% isolate, only half as much as, um, as they require, then the bees can only process half of that protein source and, and they'll need to expel the rest. They, they can't process it. And I think of this like a dog. Um, you know, if you if you look at dog food, um, then uh, you dog a, a high quality food, and and it'll almost look after itself. There's not so much clearing up to do. But if um, if the food is um, is not of a high quality, then you you, can, you know you need black bin bags rather than um, little poo bags to go around with you. It's the same with bees, and what we see with bees is um, is a pollen block where there's a, a small amount of, um, of brood 
surrounded by pollen. And it's easy to make that for and think that there's um the of pollen and, and there's no problem. But actually what you're seeing is that it's pollen of uh, or, or protein of a low quality low, um, ratio of, of essential amino acids and, and the bees are unable to to fully process it. So if we look at this at a only level, uh, on average, bees consume around um, somewhere between 20 and 60 kilograms of pollen a year. You can grade that pollen um, by the percentage of crude pollen it can. So pollen obviously isn't all protein. Um, below about 20% protein content of pollen, we consider low quality. Above about 30 would be excellent quality. And, and this then has a knock-on effect. For every 10 grams of protein that a colony needs, if they've got a source of excellent quality pollen, so about 30% or more crude protein, they only need to collect 48 grams of, of pollen to get that 10 of, of protein. But if the, the pollen available is low quality, it's only got about 20% crude protein content, and they might need to collect 80 grams of pollen to get that same 10 grams of protein. So back to the colony level, you can have an increase in, in um, pollen requirement from 40 kilograms if it's excellent quality um, pollen, high crude protein content, up to about 60, 70 kilograms of low quality pollen. And this um, manifests itself as a smaller brood area, fewer bees, and, and reduced honey production because obviously there's there's a huge amount of additional workload in, in, involved in all of that additional pollen. So the the two factors that I've touched on there, um, the ratio of, um, of essential amino acids, um, for example, the four percent isoleucine, and the percentage of crude protein, um, put put them together, and and it um, explains why there's a general rule of thumb that bees need six to eight sources of, of pollen at any one time to, to maintain a healthy colony. And you can see that quite easily as a beekeeper by watching bees coming into the hive on the on the board um, or, or checking your frames and looking for colours of pollen. And if you can see seven, eight different colours of pollen in there, then in general, your colony is going to be thriving and it's going to have a, uh, a well-balanced diet and it'll have the, um, the protein that it requires in the quantity and quality that it requires. If not, that's when you need to start thinking about making a, an intervention possibly. Um, because if there isn't enough pollen or, or if the pollen isn't high enough quality, um, nurse bees can't enough royal jelly. They'll also um, evaluate the of the colony um, and they they will first of all reduce the amount of royal jelly that they're feeding to to larvae um, and eventually they'll start eating larvae and, and eggs uh, reasons for that one is that um uh, obviously it, it, it's the growth of the colony um to to match better to the available protein um, but the other reason is that, that those eggs and larvae are them, in themselves excellent um, protein sources. So they're, they're really um, helping those, those nurse bees to stay alive. So I've talked a lot about some um, protein this evening. I hope you've eaten already. I apologise for showing this, this picture. Um, but I think really important and um, it's analogous, um, I think, to, uh, to us. Um, having having a Big Mac and Coke three times a day every day. So beekeepers often fall into the trap of, of just feeding sugar to their bees. Um, you know, you might heft your colony or, or, or look at it and think, I, I need to boost this colony. I'll, I'll feed it some sugar. Um, and, and that's fine. As I said, I think it's it's equivalent to, to living on, on Big Mac and, and Coke. You know, we might feel full and we might even feel happy in the short term, but eventually it's not going to do us any good at all um, and, and same with bees it's it's not uh, just feeding them with sugar um, is, is not a, a balanced diet for them and and it in the long run it's um it's not going to benefit that colony 
So what I, I normally go on to at this point, um, and I will very briefly, um, is to sort of talk about how monoculture and, and pesticides and lack of foreign, and here in this country we have a huge amount of loss of for example, between fields and all sorts of problems that um, that have affected the nutrition to, to honeybees. Um, it, it's it's becoming increasingly the case that beekeepers need to support the nutrition, the natural forage available to bees. Um, and, and so I'd, I'd sort of ask the question, how how can you you go ahead and do that? Um, and and we obviously, as a commercial organisation, we we do have a solution to that. Um, we have a, uh, a protocol, an annual um, protocol uh, of nutritional um, products. Now, I am going to talk about them briefly. Um, in fact, you, you guys have some um, some impressive uh, feeds available in the US. Um, and so we are not um, our, our feeds too high, heavily um, in your part of the world, um, simply because the uh, available feeds that you have are, are good um, and, and we can never um for these premium products get a, a price that's going to be competitive but if you if you listen to what i'm you're going to touch on and, and think that sounds great then do go and speak with your local your beekeeping equipment and, uh, and and we'll be happy to talk to them about uh, about stocking uh, getting stock to them um I, I've just seen a question about the um, how to evaluate the quality and amino acids of commercial formula. Um, I'm I'll come back to that question a little bit later if you don't mind. I hope that's okay. So um, our, our feeds, we've got three, um, which are broadly to be used in sort of build up period um, during the honey flow and then. Um, after the honey flow, when the winter bees are, um, are trying to strengthen themselves ready for that winter period. Um, in, in the springtime, we've got a product called V2B Feed Power, which is a liquid feed. It's um, mixed with sugar syrup and fed to the bees. We compared it with, um, with just sugar syrup and found that after 30 days, um, you got roughly two extra frames of brood. Um, what's perhaps unique about our um, liquid feed, feed to feed power, is that it's um, in some research recently that vitamin C apparently has some beneficial effect, um, perhaps giving a little bit of tolerance um, against varroa. Obviously, it's not a treatment for varroa, um, but it seems to have some kind of beneficial effect. I believe that beta feed power is the only commercial feed which has vitamin C added in it. Um, but the, the, the point is, it's packed with free amino acids. And so you remember that um, image I showed of the bee gut with the free amino acid. So don't need to break those down into, um, into component amino acids. It's already been done. They can immediately re repurpose those um, amino acids into the enzymes they need to um, process the, to metabolize the protein um, into, um, yeah, to, to convert protein into enzymes, which then metabolize the um, nectar, the glucose and fructose. So um, what's important with V-Power um, is your feed a lot of amino acids. You also need to make sure that there is protein available, perhaps by using a patty um, or, or, or something similar, to make sure that there is that protein available that can be converted into the enzymes. It's not just amino acids that bees need. That will give them a huge boost. And, and we also need to be very careful about swarming when using this product. They, they need protein at the same time. What it's like in, in Wyoming, but in the UK, uh, what we call June gap. Um, uh, and it's, it's quite common that um, during the honey flow, there's lots of nectar, um, but not enough pollen and it comes that leads to a sort of boom and bust where the colony builds up unsustainably quickly and then collapses um, so we developed a bee to feed nutrient which is a powder wrinkled on the brood frames during the honey flow it's not going to get into the um, the super honey um, 
and uh, just every time you go to the really you can you can sprinkle a teaspoon on um, and we, we got lots with this we found on a here in Argentina um, where it was a really good year for honey production there was about a five percent increase about two kilograms more honey and season much worse for honey production um, we still found that two kilogram increase so in this case it then was a was an increase of 90 percent um, so making a, a big difference to the amount of honey that they're able to produce because they're they're not getting that protein that they need at the same time as the the nectar that's going into honey and then we have tea which can be used in spring in conjunction with bt power but um, formulated to be um, exactly what they need um, when the, the, the winter bees are, are building up. Again, when, when you use it in the spring, paired with just a, a sugar fondant, it, um, it gives an extra frames of brood roughly um, after a month of, of use. So you might be thinking, well, Vita Feed Power gave two frames extra, Vita Feed Patty does as well in the spring. You're, you're saying it might be a good idea to use the two of them together. So does that mean I'm going to get four frames more brood? Um, uh, the answer is no. Um, it took us a while to work out why, um, but it's because going back to the very beginning, we've got that one queen in the colony. She can only lay limited number of, of eggs um, and uh, so what we're doing is we're pushing on that colony to its maximum potential with these products and they can, it can go no faster. Really benefiting the colony. Uh, but more importantly than that, perhaps you've got um, healthy um, and productive bees. Just very briefly, because this is um, figures that are, are related to the UK, not the US. But we looked at, um, at the cost of, of what sort of protocol we call might cost over the if you use the recommended amount um, and, and the effect that it has. We looked and, and in many, many trials in, in Argentina, in Europe, in the UK, we found about a third more honey, about 35% um, compared with, with just um, what may be more interesting to you, particularly if you're a commercial farmer, um, is that for every dollar you spend on this uh, these treatments, you get roughly four and a half bucks back in terms of, of honey that you can sell. Um, obviously, that that figure is going to vary depending on the cost of the feeds and the um, the cost of honey, uh, or the price you're, you're getting for your honey. But as I said, we're also seeing, and, and this is what's so important about good nutrition, is that the, the colonies are healthier, they're better able to resist disease. Um, and they're better prepared for winter and, and then to, to come bouncing into spring. So that's our, our nutritional protocol. Um, for those that don't know about Vita, I just wanted to, um, to give a brief overview of, of who we are. Um, and, and again, just to sort of open this up to any questions you might have. Anyway, so ultimately, we are a commercial organization um, and, uh, and so these products are, are what enable us to keep going. So if there is anything that you'd like to know about these products, please do um, do let me know and I'll try to address it. So for our control, we've got Apigard, um, thymol based gel, Apistan, the um, Tauflivalinate strip treatment and a relatively new the Bee Gym, which is um, it's like a scratching post for bees. It's a, a grooming device which helps the bees to um, to groom for our off. I just wanted to address um, a couple of things about Apigard. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful product and we, we hear people having a couple of objections to it. And I, I just wanted to um, sort of address them. Um, calling them myths and facts is, is a little bit uh, over the top. Uh, but people, people say, for example, Apigard is a thymol. Does that mean it's got a very narrow temperature window? Um, yes, since I have a temperature window, it's, uh, uh, it works in two ways, by um, station um, and by contact. The, the key is essentially if the bees, are, if you see them in and out of the hive, then the apigar is going to be working. Uh, we, we can um, 
uh, temperature range and, and obviously the most thing is to follow the label and, and use it according to the label directions. Uh, but essentially, Bard is, is a temperature um, reactive gel matrix. So the, the gel expands when the temperature to allow quicker and um, more efficient vaporization, and, and it contracts when the temperature is high to prevent the uh, vaporization happening too quickly. Um, and basically, if the bees are flying, it's, it's working. People also, we, we all as beekeepers love strip treatments. Um, and, and people say, well, no, I, I'd love to use Apigard, but it's just too much work. Uh, with a strip, what's really important, whether it's Apivar or Apistan or any of the other strips, chemical treatments must be used for a period that they're that's on the label, usually six to eight or 10 or 12 weeks, um, and they must be removed. Apigard being a, a natural treatment, um, and being one that degrades as, uh, through um, the bees getting it in their mouth parts and on their body and injecting it from the colony. One of the ways that it works and as they're doing that it comes in contact, it leaves a trail through the, the frames and, and comes in contact with the mites and also through that vaporization it, 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 it's going to naturally disappear over the period of treatment. So um, with Apigard you need the first dose and then come back, I can't apply the second dose Essentially, the same amount of work as um, as applying the strips, coming back and, and taking them away again. Um, and I've seen uh, commercial beekeepers applying Apigard, and, and I can tell you it is it, it's just as quick as um, as putting strips in the colony. Why am I making a, a, a sort of big fuss about this? Um, it's because I think it's really important that as beekeepers we are trying to. Um, extend the, the longevity, the lifespan of the treatments that we have available. There's a finite treatments um, and we need to work together to, to extend that. One of the best ways to is integrated pest management, which has various facets. One of them is rotation of treatments. It, it is to rotate treatments, not use the same one time after time, year after year. And Apigard is a fantastic rotational partner um for the strip treatment uh, and some that um but i think if you try you'll you'll find that it's um it's worth it. uh, just to answer a question of app guard is available um in the us through most of the the retailers again if it's not have a chat with them ask them why they're not stocking it we'd be happy to um to supply them very briefly on on apistan uh um, we've sold Apistan World um, for more than 30 years for historical antitrust reasons that I don't fully understand. Apistan was always handled in the US and Canada by a different company. But in the last uh, 18 months or so, we, we've taken over less than that, sorry, six months, we've taken over sales of, of Apistan. And it's, it's the one subject I've found that can unite beekeepers. You know, you ask... Um, three beekeepers a question and six opinions except if that question is is tell me about apistan in which case you'll only get one opinion and that is oh it doesn't work anymore uh well that may be the case in locations um, particularly where a lot of the the active ingredients being used um but i i'm here to tell you that it's not always the case apistan we sell around the world um it's still our biggest selling product it's still highly effective, as you can see from some of these studies, um, including in the US. Um, it comes back to that point that I was just making about rotation. What we have found is that particularly in Pakistan is not effective the second season. In most countries around the world, we'd say it's it may not be effective in the third or fourth season if you continually use it. In the US, it seems that the resistance is, is different. And if you use Apistan one year, it won't be very effective the following. So it's it's really vital to um, to uh, use that um, product rotation strategy. We've got the nutritional products, which I've already talked about. Uh, we have our um, field kits for American and European fowl brood, uh, like pregnancy kits. Uh, you you pull in, and, um, and about ten minutes later. You'll, um, you'll have a, a re result as to whether you've got either you know, um, American 
foul brood uh, with, with the same accuracy as a lab test. We've got our, our swarm attractant wipe, which is uh, it's an impregnated wet wipe uh, that can be put in a bait box or an empty nuke or a, or a hive um, and is extremely to, to be eaten when they're swarming. And just new on the, on the market again in the US, um, for regulatory reasons, it was not sold in the US for many years. Um, previously known as, as B401 or Sertan, we now have, um, have a slightly improved formula which is called B402 or Sertan, uh, which is a, a wax moth protection um, product. It's a, it's a highly concentrated bacterial solution that you dilute with water um, or mix with water, spray onto the frames back and front, leave them to dry, complete protection against damage from wax moth um, over the season. So those are our, our products. Um, thank you again for, for listening to me. Um, and um, if you do have any questions about any of our products or about the nutritional aspect, um, please do put them in the chat um, or, or come on um, on the video and, uh, and, um, and I will do my very best to, to answer them. So I'm just going to go back then. So how does one evaluate the quality and nutritional amino acid balance of commercial formulas? Um, really uh, pertinent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, the there are there are papers out there um which uh have have researchers have done work into exactly what is needed by um by bees i think one of the first things to do is to ensure that you use a product that has been designed from the ground up for bees um and that's that's first of all a, a good indication that it's going to have the the correct nutritional balance. Um, if it's a repurposed animal feed, which which some are, um, then it's, it's not necessarily going to have the right balance that bees need. Um, unfortunately, the only other advice I can give is a sort of quick and easy way to do it. There is a great paper um, out of Australia. I think it's called Fat Bees, Skinny Bees, um, or something like that, which has some fantastic information in it about the needs of bees. Um, and there's there's a lot of other information available. Um, there, there isn't a sort of simple way to um, to get that information. No, I'm afraid. What, what I can tell you, um, if I want to 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 indulge myself um, with an advertising pitch, is products have been developed from the ground up for um, for honeybees specifically, based on all the latest research. Um, we're constantly um, looking at that and, and if we're, we're doing iterations of the formula to make sure that we do have the very best balance of, of amino acids and, and other nutritional components. How does Apigard affect the laying performance of the queen while the product's in place? That's a question as well. Um, it's, it can affect um, the laying performance, it, it, particularly if used in spring time. Um, any thymol product can cause the queen to temporarily get go off lay. Um, it might only be a day or two. Um, it, it, it's almost always temporary, um, but it, 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 and it's very rare. Um, but it, it is a possibility with any thymol product that the queen will go off lay for a few days. We normally recommend not using Apigard in the spring for that reason. Uh, because at that time, obviously, you want the, the, the height of the colony to be developing as fast as possible. Um, but as I said, it's a, it's a rare effect. Uh, so uh, it's a balance that, that, that one needs to take in the um, need for varroa treatment um, and, and colony development. Um, in general, you won't find any problems, but it is possible that the queen will go for a few days. Um, I've got a question here that I'm afraid I can't answer. Um, we hear a great deal about honey bean protein and carbohydrate. Could you comment on the fats, lipid in the honeybee diet? Um, I am not an expert. Um, I, I have a, a broad understanding of, of honeybee nutrition, but I, I'm not an expert on lipids, um, their, their use in the, in the diet, um, their role in the diet. So going to skip that. And what I'll do is I'll put my email address in the chat here. 
please email me with that question and I will pass it on to, um, to Paolo, our technical director who developed these. He, he knows everything there is to know about honey nutrition and, and I'm sure that he'll be able to, to answer that for you. Um, I'm just going to put my, my yes in there now. And any other questions, um, please do um, do drop me in. I'm looking yeah. at, uh, and you, sorry. And you're welcome to unmute and ask Sebastian a question if you want. That's certainly welcome. I think what it, it comes down to is we just don't have a good floral diversity anymore. And these you, the products that you create are becoming more and more important. I, in Wyoming, which is where a lot of or attendees are from in parts of Colorado, we have a very short growing season, Sebastian, and, and we're almost always in a drought. And so our variety of flowering plants is very limited. People who live in town and have bees and beehives in town actually have an advantage over people who live out in the county and that there's a lot more flowering resources in, in town. And, you know, I know I've, I've certainly used your products and I've had good luck with it. If any, again, if anyone's got any questions, um, go ahead and Tina, I see you've got your hand raised. You can go ahead and ask a yeah. question. Um, okay, I'll be putting my hives pretty close to some, um, I'm using it for wind block of my pine trees. And we spray every year for pine beetles. So this year we're not going to spray. So my question to you is, is there something that I can use that will be okay with the bees, but also protect my trees. Okay, so Tina, I'm gonna jump in and answer that question for you. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not spraying, we're not, we are not spraying for mountain pine beetle anymore. And, okay. and it's just, it, it just hasn't warranted itself. We are starting to go into a drought I would highly recommend that you water your pine trees extra. Yeah, we did that yesterday, yeah. Okay, and, and, and even if you think you've watered them enough, give them some extra water. I mean, seriously, okay. you just, you're just not gonna overwater a pine tree in, in Wyoming. So that's, that's my suggestion for, for that. If you really feel you need to do something, I would recommend an imidacloprid or neonicotinoid. I know that's a bad name in, in the industry, but, but for non-flowering trees and shrubs, this stuff, the neonicotinoids are just amazing. They're, they're, not, they're not getting sprayed into the environment. They have a very low lethal dose so that they're not okay. harmful to mammals. And if you need to go that route, that's the way you should go is, is with like a soil drench for this. But I would encourage you to plant flowering trees and shrubs and put in a, a wildflower garden. I'm going to put in two acres of um, mustard and wildflowers. So I was hoping that that would work. Okay. Uh, Anybody else? <laughs> oh, they do it. You're welcome to call me at the office and I'll come out. Okay, I might. <laughs> <laughs> do that. Um, I'm just kind of, I've noticed a question, I think, from, uh, from Lisa about the bee gym, um, asking for a picture of it. So I'm just going to chat. Um, I wonder if I can do this. Um, I don't know if you can see two pictures there. So there's um, one which is a, um, an image of the bee gym itself. Um, so it can, uh, what you can see is that it's got some spikes um, and some what we call flippers, and down at the bottom is is basically fire. Um, so the bees go go through, uh, and, and invented it is a videographer, and he's got great video. Um, some of it's on our website. The bees using it, and and you can see that the bees uh, choose to go through it. Bees coming back with pollen choose not to. Um, they don't out 
um, they go to the, the, the fishing wire, um, they, they, where they go through that part, um, they're, they're sort of bent over, so anything on their backs is knocked off. And then they'll, they'll sign grooming themselves on either the flippers or the spikes. Um, and it, um, it removes um, Varroa, and, and what it does is it, uh, it, it damages the Varroa, usually their, their legs or, or similar, um, so that when they grew, they're, um, they're not able to, to recover back into the colonies. Um, what you can see, if, if you can see two pictures, on that is, a, um, is a, an image of a sticky floor um, that's been put under a hive with a bee gym in it. Um, and you can see there the effect of the gym um, with the, the increased debris and, and varroa mite falling underneath where the bee gym is. You can see almost a, um, a mirror image of it. Um, so it's having some kind of effect. We, we'd never sell this varroa treatment. Um, we would recommend that you use a, um, a, a, a approved medicine for varroa, varroa treatment. Um, but th this does um, clearly have, have some kind of effect on um, her in the colony. I hope that um, that answers that. Uh, and I so, saw, sorry. So Sebastian, I see a question here from Deb. It says, what do you recommend over the winter, if anything, or is the fall supplement enough? And so our winters here can be six months, maybe maybe eight months. So. So we have a short, short season. So what, how can you help us get through the winter? Yeah, um, that's a, a slightly controversial topic actually at the moment because the received wisdom, the general knowledge is that, um, that one shouldn't feed with protein over the winter um, because we don't want to um, encourage the winter. Um, you know, we want, particularly in your cold winters, we want the bees to, um, to, to just survive and, and not, um, think that it's time to um, to start developing brood early. Um, there is some work recently that suggests that may not be um, the issue that we think it is. Uh, but in general, um, the the key with winter nutrition is to um, is to ensure that uh, the sugar source essentially is is as close to the cluster as possible, um, so that the bees can can get to it and where possible, um, and I, I don't know exactly what kind of weather conditions you're getting and, and whether your your colonies are under of snow over the winter or not, but if possible, you know, you want to be hefting the colonies, just having lifting them up slight to, to feel uh, the, the weight of them and, and you get a sense of sort of stores they've got available. Um, and, and I personally say, and, and this is a personal opinion rather than any opinion, but the, the, the best um, winter for bees is, is honey um, and, and where possible if you can leave um, honey stores for them um, then then that's going to be the, the best over the winter. So Sebastian we've got a question here about water and bees. I just put out a, a tray of water. I've got little pebbles in it and water and then I've got one that's got a sponge and soaked with water. But uh, the question is, is there a natural way to encourage bees to stay away from livestock and livestock waters and feeders? I, I have that problem here at my ranch. So <laughs> it's, it's always interesting. Um, I mean, I guess uh... Screens is the only thing that mind. Um, uh, you know, if you if you look at the flight path of the bees to the water, um, if there's some way that you can you can screen it with a sort of six foot high hedge or, or, or um, mesh fence or something similar, um, so you're preventing them from having a direct flight line through that water. So you're directing them to to an easier to access water source. I mean, that's just something off the top of my head that may work. Um, uh, I'm, I've not heard of any research into, into how one could do that. Um, I, I can't give a scientific answer, I'm afraid. So we've- I don't, I don't know questions of what they do. Yeah. I, I just, I try to put water diversions all over the place to keep them away from the livestock so and it works it, it works to have water close to the hive and so they go right there and, and they're not hunting for it 
A uh, question from Ken. For wintering, is there value in adding high fructose corn syrup to the sugar, sugar solution? And does a bee shed help bees survive in the winter? So here in Laramie County, where I live, we have a lot of potato sellers. There was a lot of potato um, operations and cropping done here. And so there's these underground structures for holding potatoes over winter. And so we've got some of those. And then also um, we see pictures of bees and sheds. And, and I know a guy up in Jackson has got his bees in the shed. So what's your opinion about the high fructose corn syrup and bee sheds? Yeah, um, we've, we've done um, trials with um, using high fructose corn syrup and never really seen any statistical difference. Um, so maybe some you, um, but I, um, you know, we, we haven't seen it. We wouldn't particularly recommend that it's it's anything that's um, sorry to do, but at the same time, we say don't do it. Um, we, we just haven't seen the evidence either way in the in the very limited number of trials that we've done. It's It's not something that we've spent a lot of time looking at. On, on the sheds, again, we have no direct experience with bread um, and, and listen to some of the work that's been um, been that. And it, it sounds really promising. Um, I, know, I know both in um, particular in Washington State, for example, and, and up in Canada, there's um, a lot of a lot of work on, on that and, and, and the carbon dioxide levels in the sheds, for example, can be manipulated um, I, I think it, it's potentially going to be the future for um, for commercial um, beekeepers, and and there's a, a, a opportunity there as well for someone to um, to rent out um, space in a shed to um, to sideliners and, and hobbyists as well. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of that happening anywhere, um, but there's um, certainly the, the possibility of that happening. Okay, thank you for those answers. Any other questions? And again, you're you're welcome to unmute, raise your hand, put it in chat. Um, great opportunity to um, ask some questions on nutrition and varroa and whatever comes to I've your mind. I've just seen seen one on the bee gym. Where to bit? Um, best place in the hive. Now we we used to say um, use it. Uh, with an open mesh floor, um, so the the, the mite out of the bottom and can't can't come back into the colony, and, and place it on the just inside the entrance, um, so that the bees can choose to use it or not. So leaving a little bit of space back from the entrance on the on the door, um, and and positioning it so that the, um, the sort of fishing wire is at the front of them as well. Um, then. The, more closely and um, we, we sort of discovered that the mites have been damaged during this grooming process. And so there's not much of a risk of them reattaching to other bees or reinfesting the colony. I found that there seems to be a better effect on top of the brood frames. Um, so essentially either is, is, um, is effective. It can either be put up on top of the brood frames, some cluster or or down underneath them on the floor. Um, one thing that we have found is um, useful is to move it around every now and then. Um, so it can be left in the colony all year round, um, but it, it, the bees get used to it after a time and stop being so interested in it. If that's the case, um, you can reignite that interest by, by washing it um, in, in soda solution, for example, bring it back or, or just even moving it a couple of inches um, and uh, and that sort of re re the interest of the bees and allows them to use it more. And and then Sebastian, what about feeding year round with 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 uh, like a nutritional solution for them? Is that feasible? So I didn't quite catch that. Okay, so as far as like feeding your bees, you know, again, here, here in the Rocky Mountain West, we have just a really short growing season. And we'll have a summer 
where nothing's blooming or things have stopped blooming or slowed down and so there's not a huge resource of flowers. And we can actually lose colonies in the summer. So is there, do you have a summer approach in addition so, to- So yeah, I approach? mean, it, it, it sounds to me like, um, and I'm not gonna say specific feeds because um, they may be difficult to get hold of, but something like a, um, a, a, a feed with a lot of free amino acids and our, our feed power, um, but a feed that is sold as, as having a lot of amino acids would be great in the, in the early spring when the seasons first started, because if you've got a short growing season, you need that colony to boost as quickly as you possibly can and to, to take advantage of that, that short period. Um, so give them those free amino acids, let them develop as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And then during the flow, you can switch to a, um, a more protein feed. And again, our, ours, the, the appropriate one of ours to use at that time would be V to feed Nutri, which is a powder. Um, and and so what's what's great about having it in a form can just be sprinkled. It doesn't need to be sugar syrup or anything like that. Um, it won't make its way into the super honey. It's no condition and it's it's packed with with proteins and vitamins um, and some amino acids so that again if you if you have that um period there's, there's perhaps next are coming in but not pollen available so the bees aren't able to take advantage of the flow um then then the nutri is is the perfect thing to use at that time of year okay thank you a question from elizabeth it says a brand new beekeeper here. This is my first spring and we still have two feet of snow here, but the temps were 11 degrees Celsius today. So I'm opening my three hives tomorrow to inspect and see how they are. I have three stored honey frames I plan to put in now and will add protein patties and a one-to-one -one sugar syrup once the temperatures rise consistently. Do you think this plan is okay? Uh, well, three feet of, oh, sorry, two feet of snow. That, that's about um, 15 years worth of snow where I am. Um, I don't speak to the the, um, the wiseness or otherwise of, of inspecting at them. Uh, we, we, I don't have the experience with that weather to, to tell you whether now is the time to inspect or not. Um, you guys on the call will know much better than me. Um, but in terms of the nutritional um, program that you've outlined, um, yeah, that that um, that sounds good to me. The, the the key thing that you've picked up on there is you've got the sugar, um, but you're also uh, the proteins. Um, so you you're you're not doing the Big Mac and and chips, your uh, Big Mac and fries. You're um you're you're giving that balance, um, and and that should allow your bees to um, to develop nicely. So I would um, I would say that plan sounds good to me. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Again, you're welcome to unmute and ask the question or type it into chat. Yeah, Sebastian, some great information and the whole trying to feed your bees and keep them healthy and keep them going through the winters and summers even is so challenging here in the Rocky Mountain West and up in Canada. Um, we're trying, we're trying our best, but it is challenging. I, I think the good good news is that the researchers are really um, homing in on this now and, and realizing how important nutrition is. Uh, it is, as I said at the top, um, an area that's been neglected. Um, I think both by beekeepers and by rivers, um, but it's it's now coming out, um, uh, having its moment in in the sunshine and. Um, and it'd be good, especially um, for for beekeepers in a in a tough place like like you guys are. Um, the the more information we can we can get, um, the the better you can manage your bee. Yep. So I started doing the Wyoming Bee College in 2014, and ever since I've always had someone that could talk about honeybee nutrition and and how to keep your bees healthy and. And it has changed so much just since 2014. And it's just, it's, I'm sure next year it'll be even more different than it was this year. So we'll, we'll know more. 
which is very cool. And there was uh, a while, like two years ago, a young grad student did some research on why honeybees were visiting a mud puddle. You know, we've always talked about clean, fresh water. Well, these bees were at a mud puddle. It turns out the bees were after the salts in the mud puddle. So, you know, who would, who would think that a bee needed salt? So I think I'm, I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. So I uh, think Catherine, I, I had a question real quick. Great, go. Um, Sebastian, there was a, a picture in your slideshow. Um, I was just hoping maybe you could clarify it a bit. It looked like somebody was pouring some liquid over some frames or did I not see that correctly? That was a, a feeder. Um, so that, that was one of the, the very early pictures I think you're referring to. Or, uh, or could, have been, could have been one of the later on experiments. Um, I, I yeah, that, like that would was, have been... I, um, I want to say it was maybe like six slides from the end, maybe. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can go back to so, it. Tara, what I think you saw was there's an in, in hive feeder that looks like a frame and so you can pour your sugar syrup and your um, minerals and whatever else in there and it's it, it keeps everything cleaner for sure and yeah there it is that's it right there i think it was the one the one slide before that actually so what you're seeing on, oh. the, on the right hand side of that hive is the feeder um that and, yeah that one uh, he's um he's pouring the that's um, sugar syrup mixed with V feed new uh, V feed power. Sorry, um, into the the feeder. Um, so it's it's there in the in the hive. What we do is um, we put a um, a floating piece of wood in that at the top so that the bees can rest on on the wood um, and, uh, and and feed on on that solution. Um, and it, and it's there in the hive at the right temperature. Okay, I, I have never seen that before. It's very cool. I just, um, one of my friends who's on here right now, she, um, one of her glass jars uh, leaked and I think she lost a hive or a, a, a colony because um, they got wet and uh, over the winter. So it was a little bit sad to hear that. This, but this would be just I was, I was a little the, concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, as I said, you, you can see it a little bit more clearly here on the right hand side. It's a different feeder actually in that hive, but it's the same principle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Tara, I think I've got one in the office. I could show you how that one works. And then, um, Sebastian, from Dave, my bees go after coffee grounds in the compost in the winter. They ignore it the rest of the year. I, I'm sure they're not looking for that morning cup of coffee, but is there something in the coffee grounds that would attract them? Uh, that's again, that's something that I can't answer, but it's fascinating, and it's that's the um, that's the the start of a of a thesis there. I think that's um, that's a research for for somebody to um, to look at what, what what it is in the coffee grounds that the bees are after at that particular time of year, and and uh, um, but no, I, I can't answer that. I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay, and then again, everybody, this has been recorded, and then I archive all the beekeeping programs on the website, and I've put the website here in the chat box, so that's um, very accessible. Well, Sebastian, I'm not seeing any other questions, and I know that we've kept you up very late since you're in, in England, and the time zones are huge. So I really appreciate you spending an evening, morning with us. <laughs> and uh, I am going to end it here and say good night to everybody. And just as a reminder, the March 20th is an all day beginning beekeeping program. And then on March 25th, I have David Lewis talking about building a pollinator habitat. So Sebastian, again, thank you very much. Everybody have a good evening and we will talk to you, see you at another beekeeping program, hopefully. Thanks Sebastian. very much for having me and thanks for joining me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.